All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? It's lunchtime. We could do a little better than that, right? How's everyone doing? All right. It is still only uh, day one, so usually I, I expect a little bit more energy on day two, but that's okay. Uh, so welcome, of course, uh, to Microsoft Ignite to tour here in Amsterdam. It's always one of our favorite places to come. I'm going to jump right into content today because uh, I do love presenting. This is actually one of the coolest rooms I've gotten to present in, too, being a little forum situation like this. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about Office 365 Pro Plus deployment and servicing update. Uh, I'm going to try not to show a whole lot of slides and get into some demos and into what's going on and some roadmap items. Um, a little bit larger of a room, so it's not quite as easy to take uh, kind of an open Q&A like I like to usually do. Um, but if you have any questions that are relevant to the entire audience, feel free to shoot your hand and I'll try and do some active Q&A. Otherwise, I do make myself available after the session and I'll head over to the, uh, the hub area so we can whiteboard stuff out or talk about your uh, kind of current situations. But other than that, uh, real quick, my name is John Grushek. I sit back in uh, Redmond, Washington at Microsoft Corporate Headquarters. Uh, and what I do is I work on anything M365 readiness related. And what that really just means is Office, Windows, EMS, Customers Field Partner Training. Uh, that's it. I, I own tech readiness for anything M365 related. Uh, and so that's why we're going to be talking about Pro Plus here. So real quick, I do want to call out. Um, I'll go back a slide here. Office 365 Pro Plus and Office 2019 are not the same thing. How many of you knew that? Oh, all right, everyone is very, very current. Uh, so second question, how many of you think Office 2019 is more current than Pro Plus? All right, I think some people did their homework. Yes, Office 365 Pro Plus is the evergreen servicing model that snaps into Office 365. It will always have your newest feature set in it. Office 2019, although it is called 2019, actually does not have a newer feature set and will never likely have a newer feature set than Pro Plus. So, slide speech speaks for itself, most productive, most secure, lowest TCO. The big thing I like to highlight is many of you are starting to run into Office 2010 end of service, right? Okay. I bet there's a lot more hands than actually are using Office 2010 because I have some statistics on that. But let's kind of continue going. What's different from the last big desktop deployment? A couple big things. Uh, directory services, right? You're going to have AAD or Azure Active Directory syncing. Most of you probably have a hybrid join of having AD on-prem synced up to AAD. So you're using the AAD Connect tool. Um, big thing I want to talk about. 64-bit is now our recommended version of Office uh, or actually installing Office, whether it's Pro Plus or 2019. And this is something very new. Uh, some of you might have seen this in your Office 365 Admin Center as the way that we actually communicated this out. And the reason why we've finally been able to stand behind 64-bit being the recommendation is because we've really reduced those numbers of 32-bit dependencies in the environment. And that is really the only time that I, as a consultant, would ever recommend an entire organization to deploy out 32-bit is if you have an entire organization that's dependent on 32-bit add-ins or whatever it may be, line of business applications. 64-bit has, it, it, it's published how much better it performs, Excel, Outlook, et cetera. So we really want to highlight 64-bit, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, being able to use both Intune and Config Manager to co-manage. So there's uh, different times that you'll uh, perhaps want to centrally manage most of your devices through Config Manager, but we can still make the apps available through the Intune portal, which is something that Microsoft does for us. Um, and then the last thing we'll talk about today is really just this kind of servicing framework for both Windows and Office, right? No longer using uh, that kind of three-year cycle to update Office or Windows. Now you're expected twice a year, right? So how do we deal with that? And so, Pro Plus deployment options. Um, we're going to talk about kind of deployment and servicing here, and I'm going to switch over to a little bit of whiteboarding because this slide is very, uh, very generic and plain. So what I like to do is I'll pull open the whiteboard app here. And so, two things at its core that we need to deploy Office 365 Pro Plus. First is the Office Deployment Tool, or ODT. So again, stands for Office Deployment Tool. This is simply the setup engine that Office needs to install. It's setup.exe, get it from the download center. ODT is going to read a config XML file. This config XML file you build out through Notepad or any note editor. That is simply the metadata or the instructions that Office needs to install. So you're specifying your products, your languages, et cetera. Third thing that you need are the source files, right? The actual Office installation files. 
Cool thing though, with Office 365 Pro Plus and even Office 2019 now, is we do not need those source files to always be included or on the device, right? We have multiple options that we can pull them down directly from the cloud. We can host them in Config Manager. We can host them in a DFS share, or if you're using a third party tool, Big Fix, Symantec, whatever it may be, we have options. And so what I wanna do here is talk about kind of our three different deployment scenarios. We talk about cloud managed, locally managed, and enterprise managed. Cloud is exactly what it's gonna sound like. It's coming straight from the Office CDN. Locally managed is either taking advantage of DFS shares, network shares, or at least without using an enterprise software distribution tool. And lastly is that third uh, form of enterprise managed, which again is, uh, in this case, we're gonna talk about it in terms of Config Manager. Um, real quick before I get into this, Office 365 Pro Plus installs as click to run, not MSI. Office 2019 now also only installs as click to run. You will not see another version of Office get released that will be available in the MSI format. They will all be available in the click to run format. So Office CDN or Content Delivery Network, that is where we host our source files and our updates. So every time there is a new build of Office 365 Pro Plus or Office 2019 gets hosted in the Office CDN. This is the equivalent to WSUS. And yes, many people always ask, why does Pro Plus not leverage WSUS? There's a lot of strategic reasons, but essentially let's just focus on the fact that it does use the Office CDN and that's the answer. So if we talk about a cloud managed scenario, and I'll go ahead and start mapping this one out. Simplest terms, I have my client devices down here. I'm going straight to the Office CDN to get those source files. As soon as I go and communicate with the Office CDN, it will return them back down. Super simple process. So what we could do is if we're taking a, a uh, small organization here, what we can do is through some sort of packaging or script, we can push the ODT, the config XML file down on the client device. We call that setup engine, that setup.exe slash configure, which will kick off the install. It reads the XML file, which says, hey, go out to the office CDN to pull those source files down, right? Everything is it's still being controlled. You can te technically proxy the office CDN, which I will always say is the Microsoft expert. Please do not proxy traffic through Office 365. Uh, many customers still do. But in this terms, all you would need to push down on that device is the ODT config XML file. It's about five megs. And then you can call to pull those source files down from the Office CDN. But not many organizations quite fit in this scenario. So they're talking about, okay, we need to get everything pushed down. So we talk about locally managed. This is what most organizations are going to find themselves in, either locally managed or through the enterprise managed scenario. So you as the IT admin in a locally managed scenario, once a month, let's just keep it super basic here, you just need to pull down your source files or updates once a month. Let's go ahead and draw out a uh, DFS share over here or network share, could be either one. You as the IT admin will run setup.exe slash download and then specify your XML file. What that will do is start downloading those source files to wherever you've specified in the XML. So what we will do is store and stage them over here in the DFS system. Then we can also take our ODT and config XML file, package them up in this DFS. And then when we go and call down to the client device, we're saying everything you're pulling from is either in the DFS or we can replicate it down locally on the machine. We can do this for updates as well. Right? How you're storing off or Office updates can be done through this same process. Every single month, you're downloading the security feature updates, whatever they may be, package them up, put them in that DFS share, and then when we tell our client devices to go and look through up there, excuse me, go and look for updates, which you can specify in the XML or GPO, same thing. We're telling those client devices, instead of in that first cloud scenario, going directly to the CDN, we are going to say, don't do that we want you to go to the DFS for everything. So essentially you're keeping patching entirely internal in this scenario, right? They are never going out to the office CDN. They're never going out over the public internet. They are going straight to your DFS to pull those source files. And so I will erase those. And our third and enterprise managed scenario is I'm gonna, term or phrase it in terms of config manager, but again, big fix if you're using config man 2012 R2, a little bit less integration, but kind of similar process here. Uh, so again, config manager, current branch, uh, as long as you're on 1610 or greater, 
has Pro Plus integrated into the software update management workflow. So what this actually allows us to do is Config Manager, your uh, console, your core server, is going to communicate with the Office CDN. But I'm going to draw two arrows there. That's because we have this super unique thing within Config Manager in the Software Update Management Workflow that looks like it's actually using WSUS, but it's not. What it's doing is it's calling a uh, empty package that's essentially redirecting it to the Office CDN to pull down your source file. So that's why I like to put this little box here and just say noop.exe. So through Config Manager, it will go to the Office CDN and then pull those source files down and you'll specify where you want to replicate them out to. So I can say I want to push them out to these two distribution points. Again, these client devices will go and then communicate with those distribution points to pull down your software. This is how Microsoft initially rolled out Office 365 Pro Plus to our organization. If you domain join a machine, you will still see Pro Plus get pushed down through your software center. So we are still leveraging this as well. Now, the other creative thing that we can do is let's say that this is how our base install works. Everyone within Microsoft organization, once they get their new PC, they will get Office 365 Pro Plus installed based off a distribution point where we have everything stored. But now we say, you know what, Microsoft, we want to be a cloud-first organization. So once that initial install happens, client devices are now only going to go straight to the Office CDN for updates. Right? Simplified process. What that means is your IT admin is no longer going through Config Manager or manually calling the setup engine in itself to download source files every single month. That's the major, major advantage of going directly to the Office CDN has, is that the client devices are able to perform a check off of the Office CDN to understand the configurations that it has, find the exact source files that will match it, including languages, architecture, all that great stuff, and automatically apply those updates down to that client device. You, if you want to do it through locally or um, enterprise managed, Every single different configuration that you have, you have to make sure that you're downloading the correct source files. And that doesn't mean you need to download 15 or 20 different packages. But what that means is wherever you're hosting your source files at, let's say it's um, in a DFS share in that locally managed scenario, every single application, every single language pack that you make available needs to be in those source files for when they update against it. Key thing there, if you are updating from the Office CDN, we handle everything for you. If you're updating locally on premises, we are saying, great, we want to allow you to do that, but you need to manage these source files and you need to have the management of everything as far as every month, pulling that package down, making sure the correct languages in there are in there, making sure that you have both 32 and 64 bit packages to update against. Because what will happen is those client devices will go and update off that DFS. It won't find some of the files that it needs and those updates will fail. And then what happens, you start having six, seven, eight different builds of Office out there. And the key thing that I really like to highlight here, which is extremely, extremely common in organizations, is exactly this idea of having different locations for install and different locations for update, sometimes by business unit. Uh, there was actually a, a university that I worked with. Uh, each school, so engineering, um, sciences, whatever it may be, had its own CIO. And what that meant is each school wanted to control updates and installation off on their own, right? And so what we did is I said, hey, you can install an update wherever you want, but you should probably do some Wireshark or some network traces to figure out wh what you're actually doing here. But we went in with the pitch and said, all nine of you schools can install an update however you want. And, and that worked for them. A more uh, realistic example for probably many of you within an organization is we had a major uh, financial institution in Latin America that they had branch, uh, bank branch locations that could not tie back into Config Manager. So about 90% of their branch locations were able to have this type of architecture where they had initial install come from Config Manager, they hosted updates through Config Manager. For those 10% of branches that couldn't tie back, they did everything through the Office CDN. There was one branch that they actually still did old school USB updating from. That was the best way to do it. But again, they had the options and the flexibility to say, this specific region cannot tie back into our uh, config man infrastructure, so that's how they'll update on its own. Easy to change through the XML, easy to change through GPO, and it's what worked best for them. Because the other thing that we'll get into in, uh, in a little bit is let's say you say, you know what, that, that one-off location that doesn't have a great tie back in, we'll kind of just force them anyways. What happens when they start trying to do DO, or delivery optimization, sorry for using an acronym there. 
right? Are they really going to be trying going across a one meg pipeline to get back and share with someone or peer? What happens if they accidentally become a peer, right? And someone's trying to cash off them. Um, so big thing is, is treat your organization um, as a whole First, by identifying what is our install and update. Uh, first, our install location, then our update location. Then start to break that down into either business units, locations, uh, regional branches, whatever it may be. Figure out how that location is going to be install and update best for you. As a consultant, I would come into organizations and I would essentially say, hey, I know how ProPlus installs and how it updates. My job is to figure out how to best get that to work for you. So if you tell me that we need to go and manually call all these steps to download it and go and put it on all these network shares, if that's how your organization needs to install and update ProPlus, I will gladly support you. You're going to have a, a very busy schedule. Um, but again, if that's, we will let you install and update from just about anywhere you want. The only thing I care about is that you're on a supported build of office. So that was a little bit about going into the idea of, of hosting uh, installation and update source files. Again, key thing is, is whether it's going straight to the Office CDN, whether it's using a DFS or network shares, or using config man inf infrastructure or big fix infrastructure, we can do all of that. However you want to store and update, uh, we can essentially meet to that. And so I'll hop back into the slides here. And I did develop slides, so this all, is all shareable. It's a little bit more fun to kind of draw it out, though. Um, so I'll get back to this here. And we'll talk about kind of that beautiful bird. There we go. What's new in Office deployment? Uh, so kind of skip over the first one, and I want to go to the uh, Office customization tool. How many of you have heard that we brought it back? Handful. How many of you were very upset when we killed it off? Yeah, a lot of people were. <laughs> um, and so the Office customization tool, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, back in the day with legacy Office deployment, it used to be the way that you would customize as granular as you wanted your Office package. Then we got rid of it when we came out with Office 365 Pro Plus, and we didn't just get rid of it, we got rid of just about all the flexibility options that, we're used to, that you were used to. And so that's why a lot of people were upset, and we've brought it back, which is what I'm super excited about, and it's not just brought back and integrated into Config Manager, um, it's this idea of this Office Policy Management Service. So I'll go ahead and swap over here to the customization tool. One second, there we go. And I'll zoom in a bit, everyone in the back kind of see that a little bit. Um, so this is the OCT, and the nice part about it is this is going to build our config XML file for us, right? So we talked about the ODT needing that config XML file to read. In the past, when we first launched ProPlus back in 2013-ish, uh, um, the config XML file you had to build out by hand. And what that meant is it's basic syntax, so if you had one extra character, one extra space, your office would not only fail in its uh, initial installation, it would give you this really awesome output that would tell you to check your network connection, right? So it never told you to check the XML file, which is your issue. It would tell you to go and check your network connection. So we would have uh, architects on site that would be just de doing these insane network traces because they had an extra period in their XML file, right? So, what I'm getting at is there's a, a little bridge where we allowed this on GitHub uh, to actually generate this, and now this is fully supported and owned by Microsoft Engineering. It's integrated into Config Manager, which I'll show you in a little bit. Won't go through this whole thing, but again, architecture that you want to deploy, we specify our bitness there from our suite versions, right? We have Pro Plus, and we have our 2019 versions down here, so I'm uh, going to select Pro Plus. We have the options to include Visio and Project, both MSI and the click-to-run versions of Office 365 licensed. We get into our app set, which um, you will see some of these are automatically turned off by default uh, to be replaced by the Windows applications. So uh, OneDrive desktop is OneDrive.exe. That is the next-gen sync client that you want to be using. Please do not deploy Groove unless you are an organization that for whatever reason is stuck on Groove for regulatory or compliance. Groove is the old engine. You want to get OneDrive.exe out there, which if you have Windows 10, it's already built in. So if you actually deploy OneDrive through Pro Plus, all it's going to do is check that that OneDrive client is up to date, and I promise you it will already be up to date. Um, second one is OneNote, right? We swap that out for the UWP app that's built into Windows 10 as well. Other question is around Skype for Business. When will we see Teams? This is going to be coming. Teams will be rolling into Office 365 Pro Plus as a suite. 
Uh, we have some public documentation on that on docs.microsoft.com. The idea is, is we are not going to do any sort of rip and replace, right? We are not just going to have a cutover where we say, hey, um, you know, Northwind traders, we see that you have 50,000 installs of Skype for Business on April 1st. Those are going to cut over to Teams. That's not what we're doing. Uh, there's a much more strategic rollout of it. We understand every organization is not ready to move to Teams yet. So what you will see is Teams will become an icon in here. However, Teams does not install as click to run right now. So that is something that we're working through. So what I actually call um, an installer for it, and like OneDrive, Teams does update on its own cadence. So Teams will not update through the click to run or Office package. Teams and OneDrive will still update on its own cadence. So that's one thing to call out here. We'll go through our channels here. So you can pick um, four different channels. We'll talk about this when we get into servicing. Select the build that we want to deploy. Select our languages that we want to include. So I'm going to select English for myself. Now we get into where we want to deploy Office from, right? So are we going straight from the CDN? Do we want to do a local source path? Or we can go ahead and specify Config Manager, which we'd want to actually build this out through Config Manager itself. But we have options here. Pin icons and taskbar, which only works for Windows 7. But now we get into the upgrade options. So we have this new thing called Remove MSI, which is built into the Office deployment tool, which is exactly what it sounds like. Remove MSI when called, will search for legacy office on the machine, if found, uninstall it, and then actually layer down Office 365 Pro Plus. And what Remove MSI is built on, has anyone heard of Offscrub or Offscrub VBS? Offscrub, uh, for those of you that have uh, had the pleasures of using it, it is a brute force tool that will find anything Office related and attempt to just destroy it, absolutely destroy it. Um, and so there was a group of us consultants in the field that got really smart and said, we're going to make that best practice to uninstall legacy office. And what happened was is engineering got extremely mad at us and said, no, uh, that is not the way to uninstall office. That is a support only tool. Essentially what we, uh, back and forth, as a result, remove MSI came out of it. What remove MSI actually is, is a trimmed down controlled version of off scrub. So there are use cases for off scrub, which I'll talk about in a minute. But this remove MSI feature, again, built into the ODT, will search for Office 2010, 2013, 2016 MSI. If it finds it, it's also going to allow you the ability to query the language packs that are already included as part of that legacy office, uninstall that legacy office, grab that query and say, hey, we need these language packs installed as part of Office 365 Pro Plus. So that like-for-like -like experience, right? And what that helps you do is the fattest, or the thing that makes Office the fattest is simply language packs. Every language pack is around 150 to 250 megabytes. So if you're an organization that thinks you're going to be able to deploy 50 language packs, or if let's say you have to deploy 50 language packs, you're going to have a very large package. And so what we want to get away from is having to deploy out standard packages that say, hey, we think uh, most of our users use these 20 language packs. What we want to start to build out or deploy out is saying, we know you use these language packs, and we're going to give you like for like. And if you need additional languages, we can have you go to the software center and ad hoc those or add them on post installation, which is a supported option as well. So that's why this remove MSI is so key, because it's not only the fin uh, finally a supported way, all in one easy command line to uninstall legacy office, but again, it's going to be able to query those languages that already exist on the machine. And then from the third part of things, how many of you have project or project or viewer or project or visio usage in your organization? How many of you want to stay around with the MSI version because it makes more sense right now? It's OK. I'm not a sales guy. Um, Yes, uh, I'll be fully honest, most organizations, if they're going through an Office 365 Pro Plus deployment of, let's say, any sizable seat count, is not going to decide that, hey, we probably want to rip and replace all of our project in Visio, because sometimes those are the hardest true ups that you have to make in the organization, right? So it's very, very common for me to sit in with customers that are deploying Pro Plus and want to take advantage of project in Visio 2013 MSI. It is, I want to be very clear about this, it will work side by side. As far as supportability goes, we only test against N minus one. So we only test Pro Plus side by side against the 2016 versions. However, I can tell you I've deployed 2010 project and Visio side by side many times over. We just don't go back and actively test against older versions. But what this remove MSI allows you to do is instead of actually ripping and replacing those project and Visio 2010, 2013 versions, is we can say, hey, go find Office 2010, 
but leave that project and Visio version behind because we're gonna, go and, we're gonna go ahead and continue to leverage that. And that's very key. Because the other uh, side effect that happens with this, and when we talked, when I mentioned off scrub, is there will be use cases uh, where first you have a corrupt install. Off scrub is the answer for that. Remove MSI is a lightweight uninstall. It's not going to do that brute force. So if you have a corrupted device or a completely corrupt install, you can get off scrub. Second thing that off scrub will allow you to do that we're considering to build into remove MSI, it's just not there right now is if you have use cases, and this really happens in finance departments, that they have a dependency on Excel 2010 64-bit, right? They have a dependency on a specific application. Could be Access, too. Access is, unfortunately, another one that we see. What we can do is through Offscrub and potentially um, through the Remove MSI feature is we can leave uh, behind a standalone application as well. So the idea would be deploy Pro Plus out, side by side with just that Excel 2010 application. When you've remediated that Excel 2010 dependency, then you can finally pull that last application. The reason why we want to rip and replace everything Office 2010 related other than that single application is because your end users, if they have the full Office 2010 suite, they have no encouragement, no motivation to use the newest Pro Plus One. Unless you physically force them to and remind them every single day, use the newest Office apps, they're going to continue in their ways. I would do the same thing, right? It's familiar for us. We don't want to go take on new challenges and new learning quite yet because it'll disrupt our day. So it's very important that if you do have a side-by-side -side for Office core apps, rip and replace everything they don't need, only leave behind that standalone application that they need. So again, just to sum up, um, there's the key point for the remove MSI. But again, it's going to be able to query those language packs already installed on the machine uninstall um, MSI or legacy office. If you're doing a net new install, we can actually query the OS languages too. So instead of um, what we're doing through match legacy office, we can call something that's called match OS. And so whatever your Windows operating system language packs are, office can install based off of that as well. And again, this helps keeps, it helps keep your config XML file dynamic. So it's essentially reading what's on that user's machine versus having to push a standardized package over to them. Licensing and activation, uh, keep it pretty simple here. I'm gonna do the automatically accepted EULA, but we have this thing called shared computer activation. How many of you have VDI environments, shared devices, multiple devices, all that good jazz? Many people. Pro Plus supports shared computer activation. And the way that it works is by default with an Office 365 license, E3, E5, or even a specific Pro Plus license, you can activate Pro Plus on five devices, at, uh, five PCs or Macs at any given time. So I have this device. I actually have two other laptops in there I have activated on. I can go and activate on two more. Now, if I go and bounce to a six PC that I need to activate, I can go into my Office 365 portal or even contact my admin, say, hey, here's that device name. Just deactivate Office for me. They'll deactivate it, and I can activate on that sixth device, which then goes back down to five. What shared computer activation does is instead of giving you a long-term activation, it gives you a temporary activation token. A temporary activation token is good, say about 30 days, maybe, around there. Um, and more importantly, it doesn't count against one of your five licensing activations. So what will happen is that end user will log into Pro Plus, they'll put in their Office 365 creds, they get this temporary licensing token that gets stored down in the local profile data, they can continue using Office, um, even if they're not in the applications, at half-life, so around, let's say, day 12 through 16, it's going to attempt to auto-renew. So that means that that end user won't have to auto, uh, excuse me, activate Office again. So that's our way of saying that, hey, we, by increasing uh, this temporary token to a longer timeline and having an attempt to auto-renew, um, your end user shouldn't have to constantly be activating Office. But then the big kind of problem child that we run into is non-persistent environments, especially in the education or university space. So what we've finally allowed you to do is kind of the, the, the final, um, final cherry on top, I should say, for shared computing was when we increased the timeline, increased uh, the uh, half-life activation, we now allow you to actually roam the token with the end user's profile. So what that allows you to do is if you have a non-persistent environment, which means as soon as they log off, it, it clears out that local profile, we can have that token get roamed with them, which as you see is the checkbox here, which I'd switch to on, check it, specify where that token is going to roam to, and now anytime that user hits a, diff a different non-persistent environment or uh, they hit that new machine, that token's going to stay with them. So again, it's reducing that amount of times that they actually have to activate Office. 
That's the key thing for shared computing is we really just want to minimize how many times end users are having to type in credentials because we, as we all know, the number one most common calls has to do with passwords, right? And so we really want to eliminate how often they're entering in passwords or even credential sets. So if you have something like ADFS, Modern Auth, or a, a federation service, we can attempt to um, essentially pre-provision or actually grab um, in a shared computing environment when you use your credentials to log into the PC, we will attempt to grab those as you're logging into the profile and activate Office automatically for you as well. So in a full kind of federated environment, let's say at Microsoft, when I log into a shared PC, by the time my profile is spun up, I already have Office activated for me. Um, so shared computing, great for when you're in that kind of multi-use scenario. I wanna be very, very clear on this. If you are in the healthcare industry and you use service accounts, shared accounts, Pro Plus does not support using service and shared accounts. Each end user needs to be licensed for Office 365 specifically, which includes Pro Plus in there. So you, what we cannot do is I cannot have a service account that is activated Pro Plus here and just have 15 different people come up here and use that service account, right? Um, you could have, uh, I don't even wanna get into licensing, right? I'm not a licensing guy or a sales guy, um, but I wanna be very clear on that. For those of you that are considering Pro Plus, service accounts, shared accounts, no each person needs to be licensed to consume. Last thing, application preferences. So this is where we've actually brought back the OCT side of things. Um, so scroll over, there we go. So what I can do is actually search for, um, we can go into just office general settings. Here are all your kind of custom policies and preferences that we can set based on um, the OCT. And I wanna be very clear, this is not meant to be a one-to-one -one complete mapping of all of the previous uh, you know, 5,000 GPOs that exist. What we did is worked with our customers and understanding what are the most commonly used policies here, right? What do you need within your organization? And this is an evergreen list. Uh, so there's an engineer back at Microsoft that is constantly updating this. The other really cool thing is that since this is through a web page and even through Config Manager, it doesn't require a hot fix for Config Man, so we can update this in real time, essentially. So anytime we're getting new feedback about, hey, this new policy or new preference would be great to throw in there, back in engineering, we can have that review and decide to add it in. But again, we could take a look at, you know, file, open, save, um, bar locations. A very common one is any type of macro-enabled file. We want to open it in trusted mode first, right? Before then they actually have to click enable or whatever it may be. Um, so enabling policies like that. But then you see this sign in button up here and, and you saw me uh, briefly talk about the office customization policy or office customization service. So then what you'd be able to do is actually sign in here and see all of your different customization services that you've deployed out into the organization. So if you get into more of this kind of mobile device management, bring your device anywhere, work from any device, uh, it's not always ideal that they're going to be domain joined, so we start to get into that Intune managed uh, area. But we still want to be able to enforce certain policies down on a device that might not be a corporate owned device. Uh, for instance, uh, that is a corporate owned device. I have a personal device down there as well that I uh, constantly use with, uh, frequently use, I should say, to get back into Microsoft. So while this is domain joined, highly controlled by MSIT, this device here is Intune joined, and I have an office customization policy pushed down on my device. So certain things like what I'm allowed to um, run macro-wise or within, um, uh, let's say, Excel, for example, is control. But it's not as locked down as it is on this PC. However, Microsoft IT has the trust knowing we still regulate John's PC uh, even when it's not fully domain joined in the organization. You're going to hear a lot come out around the Office customization service over the next six months leading up to Microsoft Ignite. Again, it's a way to finally sign in and have all of your previous configurations, your build outs, all in one centralized location. We want to make it easy for you to have everything at the, at, essentially at your fingertips. And so now what I can switch to is a lab and I'll go ahead and as that loads in, I'll get the Config Manager uh, console launched here, and let's just show you some of the latest integrations that we have built into Config Manager. Um, but you will see the 
OCT built into there as well. The only place you will not see the Office customization tool built in quite yet is Intune. Uh, we're still working to have the OCT UI built in there. You'll see a slightly different configuration. Plans is to have the OCT built in there in the same, uh, same UI type format. Uh, as far as Intune goes, though, as I let Config Manager spin up, uh, we have brought the ability to use Remove MSI into Intune. Uh, previously, a requirement for deploying Office through Intune was that you cannot have Office installed on the device. So we not only relax that, we now allow you to actually take advantage of Remove MSI. So again, if I had a, a non-domain joint device that I Intune enrolled, and I had Office 2010 on there, if I grabbed the apps through our Intune store, it would be able to remove um, that previous MSI on there. The one thing is, if you install through Intune, by default, you'll be updating through the Office CDN. Uh, so through Intune, we assume that you want to do light, uh, light management, so we are going to automatically have you going uh, updating against the Office CDN. But in Config Man, we can go into our software library, and we do have an Office 365 client management dashboard here. I have no deployments active right now, otherwise you'd see some quick metric data up here. Um, this client count and client version count. Client version is especially helpful because early on I talked about having machines that were not updating correctly. If you come back saying, you know, I think we have three or four versions out there, and you all of a sudden get a pie chart that tells you there's 15 different versions out there, you have something that's broken, whether it's device is not being able to communicate with uh, the share or that content location, where there's a disconnect in general. Uh, and then you can start to dive into, okay, how many devices are on this old version that they shouldn't be? Is it a couple? Is it 100, 250? Is it a site issue, et cetera? But what we can do is we go over here to the Office 365 installer, and we go ahead and click on launch. And I just give it a quick name here, Office 365 Pro Plus going to ask me for a content location. Let me pick an easy place that it's probably not going to like. Of course not. So let me do this real quick. as the crowd goes silent. Um, sorry, there is a, a little bit of issue in this lab sometimes, so I'm just gonna go ahead and add the correct permissions. Go back, and now we should be able to get into Office. There we go. And when we click on Next, what you used to see in this wizard, for those of you who deployed Config Manager previously with Pro Plus, is you'd actually build everything out through this wizard uh, as in clicking Next, Next. Now what we do is we click on Go to the Office Customization Tool. It's going to launch a pane within Config Manager that you will see that OCT or essentially that config.office.com populated in here. There are some very minor changes between Config Manager and config.office.com. For example, if we scroll down on the update side of things, we're assuming you're going to be updating through Config Manager or through the Office CDN. So we don't specify the option to do local or anything like that. The one thing I will say is if you're deploying through Config Manager, the one thing we have to enable is called the Office excuse me, office com object, C-O-M object. What that allows you to do is it essentially tells the client device, config manager is controlling office updates. That's all that we need to do. It's automatically enabled by default if you deploy through config manager, but that's the one caveat I do like to call out is that you will need to make sure that you set that com object to true. Because then again, what happens is now the device knows to look to config manager for updates rather than trying to go out to the office CD yet. And so we can go ahead and build everything out through here, and we click Review, generate our file, click Next, Next, and we'll be able to deploy it all out. At the end of this wizard, it would start downloading a two gig uh, package of however we specified through here. Other cool thing is, is if we've already built XML files and we just uh, installed or upgraded to Config Manager, we could actually import an XML file and it'd be able to read all those settings in there for you. So it's pretty great the fact that if you've already done a lot of work, you can just go ahead and, and bring it in that way. So I talked about the easy uh, MSI upgrade. Again, I like to show things versus uh, slideware because I do make this deck fully available. So as we launch into presentation mode here, continue on. So remove MSI equals true. This is your example of what a config XML file is going to look like. So source path is going to be the D drive. We're installing the 32-bit version of Pro Plus with English US. We're also including the Office 365 version of Visio. And then you see that we have remove MSI all set to true. 
So even if this found a, a Visio version on the machine, it wouldn't uh, uninstall it. Again, highly recommend just using the OCT. No need to build out manual XML files anymore. And I hopped into the demo already. Again, like to show off uh, config.office.com. Lastly, before we go into servicing, though, this is my favorite slide to show. Uh, for those of you that are just getting into Pro Plus on the side of things, um, sometimes Microsoft does this thing where we like to make things a little bit more complex than they actually are. However you've installed Pro Plus in the past or distributed out, I can almost guarantee you I can get you to do it the same way today, right? It's not that different of a product. It's just the fact that it installs with click to run instead of MSI. GPO startup scripts, uh, basic scripting, USB drives, Config Manager, Big Fix. Uh, I've seen it all. You can deploy it all through the same way and more technically. Um, but the idea is, however you've deployed it in the past, even your apps, core LOB apps, whatever it may be, we can take advantage of it and package it up the same way. Again, it's just a different installation technology. Now we get into everyone's favorite thing of, okay, we've installed Office. Now how the heck do we keep it up to date? Uh, Office is a service. Big change as I started out no longer updating every three years, right? That feature set that you would have to worry about every three years and saying, hey, Office 2010, time to go to 2013, which many organizations would do exactly that, or they do the common skip, say, yeah, 2010 works out pretty well, then we'll just go to Office 2016. Now we're in this kind of smooth iterative place where we're doing Office as a service. Big thing here is we're gonna talk about how to actually establish a process to help Office as a Service run in your organization fluently, so you as the IT admin aren't always concerned about things breaking in the organization. I'm gonna skip over that slide and come back to it. Three channels to focus on. And to compare this to Windows, Windows has one channel, that's all. Semi-annual channel, twice a year, feature updates. Pro Plus or Office comes out with three of them, a little bit more confusing, especially because for those of you that have uh, continued on our journey on the early days, we changed, uh, we were called branches, then channels, and we changed the channel names a bunch, so thank you for being patient. Um, key thing is, though, a channel is simply the cadence at which you're going to receive updates. Features, functionalities, security, non-security, any type of fix. This is your update cadence that you're going to subscribe to Office updates. First and quickest, monthly channel. Sounds exactly like it is. Every month, you're gonna get a new Office build available that could contain features, non-features, security, non-security, kind of the whole kit and caboodle, right? Wanna be very clear, monthly does not mean once a month. Could be multiple times a month, as, as uh, some of you have seen. We do make a very, very honest and good effort to not make these packages large in size. So it's not like every month we're pushing out a three or 400 meg update. We keep these small by design. If you're on the monthly channel, you're actually gonna see very small packages in, in, in 60 to 100 meg range. But again, every single month you can expect a release. The next one we'll hop over to is we're gonna skip targeted here and go to semi-annual channel. This is what aligns to Windows, twice a year feature updates. You can skip a build and stay supported. So technically we can deploy, let's say this uh, July build, or excuse me, uh, yeah, July build of semi-annual channel and then not update again for a year. But that's where this semi-annual channel targeted build comes in, which Windows doesn't quite have, but within the Windows world, what we do is we build uh, deferment policies to create this. And what the semi-annual channel targeted version is, is a four month release, or excuse me, a four month preview of what's coming into semi-annual channel. And I wanna be very clear, semi-annual channel targeted is a fully supported working version of Office. The idea is, is that if you use even just these two builds, semi-annual channel and targeted, you have what's called flighting or QA within your organization because this group is going to be using this build of Office. Assuming nothing has broken in your LOB apps, your add-ins, your macros, your internal processes, when this build scales out to your general production group, we've already tested it. So the idea is, is that my semi-annual channel targeted build here I deploy out to, let's say, uh, this right half side of the room. I have finance representation, accounting, um, IT, all my business units. I have different people making up. And so I'll deploy that semi-annual channel targeted build out here. They'll use it for four months. As long as I got no reporting back from any business unit that said, hey, we had critical processes broken, 
I can just know that when that build now moves to the rest of the room, I shouldn't expect any breaks, right? And if there are, they're going to be one-off or isolated scenarios. And again, from the Windows world, what we do is we just use deferment policies. So my semi-annual channel build goes out to this group over here. And what I do is I set a deferment policy for this area right here and say they're going to get it 30 days later. This final group, or let's group these last two together, are going to get it 60 days later. So they use deferment policies where in Office we say, hey, we can actually subscribe to a channel that's going to control that for us instead of using deferment policies. Two separate ways to accomplish it. Um, but again, key thing here, monthly channel is going to be every single month. Your semi-annual channel and semi-annual channel targeted builds twice a year, major features. However, every single month we do publish security fixes, non-security fixes that are essentially um, not uh, always bug fixes, but aren't considered feature updates, right? So again, keeping them generally small. Uh, so you should plan to patch Office every month. Typically, if you just want to do security patching, fully OK with me. If you want to do security patching uh, every single month and only update to new features once a year, uh, I'd say you invested in a service that's putting out a lot of cool new features. But if that's how you have to do it, uh, again, you have support to do it once a year. Last thing to call out is all of these builds, as long as you're going from the um, N-1 version to the newest, will attempt to use binary delta compression. What that means is it takes the version that it has, takes a look at the version that it's going to update to, and says, I only want to pull down the difference. So if that new version or that new build is technically 2.2 gigs, it's going to say the only difference we have is about 50 megs, and that's all it's going to pull down. Right? And so that's how we keep updates small. Windows world, they talk about express upgrades or express updates. Same, same kind of general terminology here right? is the idea that we want to keep updates compressed, keep them small. However, if you're updating twice a year with features, you're going to be looking at about 150 to 200 megs. Again, on that monthly, since you're updating every single month, we typically see about 50 to 60 megs for updates. Other thing is, is Windows semi-annual channel still holds its original cadence of uh, March and September. However, the semi-annual channel for Office, in order to align with that semi-annual channel targeted build, we release our semi-annual channel in July and uh, January of every single year. And so now what I'll do is, before I switch back to the last slide, how new features scale out. And it's exactly like you would imagine with this graph. If we put out a, uh, a graphic, I should say, if we put out a brand new feature in PowerPoint, it's going to go into this monthly channel. Then it will scale out to semi-annual channel targeted. And then it will scale up into semi-annual channel. That's essentially the release cadence you can expect. That allows you to uh, adequately flight or test it out in the different channels. I want to be very clear that if it's a bug fix, a product fix, or a product improvement that actually imp helps the functionality or fixes broken functionality in Office, we will publish to all three channels universally. So what we will not make you do is get a fix for a product in an earlier channel and have to switch channels. It happened about three years ago early on with ProPlus with an Excel fix with memory crashing. A bunch of customers said, OK, we're going to switch to monthly channel, which uh, essentially is a, a payload update, right? Is you're upgrading to a newer version. So what that does is then congest your network. So we don't want you to say, hey, this new fix is available in this newer version. So we're going to take our entire organization and update them. What we do is bug fixes will go out universally. Um, if it is a product fix uh, that is not deemed critical, we will typically scale it out. But again, it, it actually does happen quite quickly. Um, so anything that's non-feature related will be uh, planned to put universally throughout the builds. And I want to go. Uh-oh, we have a frozen device. Thankfully, I know what the, the next two slides are here. Um, so we're going to get creative while I restart this. Because um, we did wrap up the, uh, the servicing side of things. Um, but what I did want to talk about is essentially the alignment to Windows, or essentially talking about deployment groups. Um, so both in the Windows and Office world, uh, you should be flighting out uh, your deployment groups and building those out. Key thing is, is make sure you have full representation from all of your groups. When we first came out with ProPlus, it only had one channel. Customers got smart and said, you know what, I'm going to have uh, the newest channel go out to my QA testers. And then I'm going to have everyone else lagged behind, essentially using a deferment policy. And so that's why we created the Office channels. 
But then the problem that happened is we created these channels and then IT was like, that's awesome. And then they put all of their IT as the early testers and then wondered why every single time that build hit finance, it broke because they had no one from finance actually testing against those newest builds. So it's very, very key to have full representation of your most pro uh, essentially problem, uh, problem causing or troublesome organizations. So finance, accounting, HR, anything with custom line of business applications, um, you know, I don't know what will come up on my profile yet. Um, but uh, so make sure you have full representation from those groups. If you have someone that is always having uh, build up, or excuse me, update issues, move them into an earlier group or deployment group. Uh, typically, we recommend three to five deployment rings in both Windows and Office. So, uh, and that is more geared towards enterprises. So, if you are a 100,000 seat organization, you might be on the five side. So, we can do you know, five broken up into here. However, you need to flight those builds out. Uh, we support it within Microsoft. Again, key thing there is it is a fully supported version of Office, um, whether you're using monthly, semi annual channel targeted, or um, a semi annual channel version. And I'll get this PowerPoint back up and running here. Sorry about that. And I'll hop real quick here to this slide. And so these are our rings that we broke down. So insiders, monthly, monthly targeted, semi-annual channel targeted, and semi-annual channel. Um, this is a lot of different versions of Office. Most organizations I work with use th uh, three. They'll add insiders in as a fourth if they like. Otherwise, again, key thing is you're typically using the monthly version with an IT, maybe 1% or a very small pocket of your IT users, just to be on the latest and greatest, right? Know what's coming, being able to test, being ahead, and it's cool to, to get to play with the new features. Then you'll have your semi-annual channel targeted group, which I took this right-hand side of the room as an example. We don't like to put numbers on it, but if I'm being honest, it's anywhere from 5 to 20% of your organization, depending on how heavy in an R&D you go. Um, a, or a, a consulting organization versus a pharmacy organization is going to have a lot different breakdown here. Uh, consulting organization, actually we had a major 200,000 seat consulting organization that only used the monthly channel. Then I worked with a, pharma, a pharmaceutical manufacturer a little bit later, and their entire R&D department had to be extremely, extremely lagged behind. Right? And that's very common. And so the idea is, is that there's no one size fits all for this other than mapping it to your organization. Um, key thing is this deployment groups works for both Windows and Office. You will always see us drive this consistently um, in Windows and Office world because most organizations flight naturally for a line of business apps or whatever it may be. It makes sense to flight your um, Office and Windows build as well. Last thing on the improvement side, uh, I talked about making these updates small. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer options, we have integration within Config Manager. Windows 10 delivery optimization, anyone taking advantage of it? Good to see. Um, Windows 10 DO, for those of you that don't know, or delivery optimization, it's a peer-to-peer -peer service. So what we allow you to do is uh, within your internal network is we can peer off of other peer devices. And so right now it works fully for Windows. We do support Office 365 Pro Plus updates for Windows delivery optimization. In initial installation is not available quite yet. Uh, we will, once we release it, it will be released in all three channels universally. We'll make a uh, blog post and formal announcement about it. Updates, again, fully supported across all three channels to take advantage of DO. Initial in installation, still working on it, should be coming. Uh, can't, I don't want to put a timeline on it since I got the camera on me. Um, so hopefully relatively soon, though. Uh, we've been working on it for, for the past couple months. Proofing tools are now finally clicked to run, and that, that should not come as a surprise to you, but unfortunately, click to run proofing tool, or excuse me, proofing tools through Office Pro Plus used to actually install through WSUS still, an up, uh, update. So now proofing tools are fully integrated into the uh, click to run updates. And the reason why that's so important is because a proofing tool is anywhere from five to 15 megabytes. Language pack is 150 to 250. Proofing tools are, again, editing, Language pack is that full office UI shell. So if someone is doing uh, work with a law firm or, or uh, organizations that are multinational and they just need to be able to review and proofread documents, proofing tools 100% makes that package small. Try and get away from language packs unless you have end users that truly actually need language packs. 
And then again, we talk about the Mac OS, uh, the remove MSI, and the ability that we can actually have end users install languages after initial installation and side load them in. And so what that helps again is keep that office package small. But again, please leverage proofing tools when available. And additionally, every language pack has around three to five companion proofing tools included in it by default. So the English US language pack actually has English, French, and I believe Spanish proofing tools included in it. So you might not actually even need to deploy it out. Uh, we don't do a great job at clarifying all of that, but there is a language identifier docs.microsoft.com article that explains all that. But essentially, again, you're looking at five to 15 megabytes per proofing tool, 150 to 250 for language packs. We already talked about the upgrader. Scheduled task is what I want to kind of close out today with. We have uh, four minutes left. Uh, this was big. Essentially, it came into MSIT first. We had organizations reach out to us and say, hey, Microsoft, we cannot hit 95% update compliance within our seven days. That is a business requirement. Please help us. And MSIT came back and said, wow, we can't actually do that either. <laughs> Right? And so what we were able to do is develop a new scheduled task that runs. And so uh, in the days of the past, the Office scheduled task, uh, what it does is it calls Office C2R client.exe, which is essentially the update mechanism for Office. Scheduled task used to run four times a week between the hours of 3 to 7 a.m. And we had properties on it that would essentially catch everyone, whether they were uh, a user that never restarted their PC or whether they actually did turn off their PC, we were able to catch them and start to check for updates. What we did is we chained that scheduled task to run every single day instead of three times a week, which was, I believe, Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. And we increased that window from four hours to 12 hours. And we talk about distributing the load on the network. We actually already have randomization built in. And so what that means is even before we change the scheduled task, if everyone in this room logged on to the internet at the same exact time, and saw that there was an Office update at the same exact time, we would all not stop downloading it at the same time, right? We've built smart uh, intelligence into the back end to scale it out even through your organization. But increasing this timeline window for 12 hours allows devices to be able to continually kind of scan and see when updates are available. Because the other really cool part about Office updates are is there's kind of three different folders that it gets moved through. And this is getting into kind of the, the geeky details. But first thing that will happen, is with this new scheduled task is that office C2R client.exe will get triggered. It will go and look at where you specified to find updates from, office CDN, locally, config man, whatever it may be. It's gonna go and check for new updates. If it finds a new build is available, it will then start to download that build into a folder that uh, we can just call it download it. Once it is downloaded into that folder, verified the hash and that it's a correct uh, and good source file build, we'll move it into a stage folder. Once it's in that stage folder, I can rip out my internet connectivity and I can still update Office. And so that's why this 12 hour window is actually more important for us is because we can actually now stage updates on the machine and make sure that people are actually updating Office. Let's say they're in a critical process of using Word all day and they keep kind of hiding that Office updates that are available. When they hit that machine restart, when they hit that kind of log off for the day, this increased uh, every single day and 12 hour window is gonna make sure that they're starting to apply that update. So again, this was the way that MSIT was able to hit compliance 95% within seven days. This actually went out around eight months ago, or actually a year ago technically is when this build went out, or excuse me, this uh, new scheduled task went out. Two things with the scheduled task. You can delete it as many times as you want. Every time you update Office, it's coming back, right? Uh, it has to. Second thing. If you're in a unique situation where you decide that I want to control updates so much, I don't like the idea of Office having automatic updates enabled. We can do that. And I had a customer that had that requirement that essentially is they wanted Office to never actually go out and check, even though they were patching internally, they never wanted it to go out and check if updates were available unless they told it to. So what we can do is set automatic updates to disabled, but we can manually call Office C2R client.exe, which then kicks off that scheduled task goes and looks for updates, but does not switch automatic updates back to on. So essentially every month you would have to call that for all of your devices, but what we did is through Config Manager, we just built an empty package that was simply office to our client.exe, some command switches on it, and it would manually tell it to go and look for updates. Now the second side of things that office to our client.exe, and I have 10 seconds left, is actually your way to roll back it's your way to change versions or uh, specify a target version. Um, and it's also a way to change channels. 
So essentially that office seat to our client.exe is a uh, executable that is very, very common to use with that setup.exe. Setup engine is a, a, essentially that, right? But that office seat to our client.exe, once you get into the Pro Plus kind of nerdy world, you will see us talk about that a lot. You can do some very creative things with it, but essentially that is that update mechanism. Wrap things up, readiness toolkit, a lot of different kind of uh, sessions on this, but again, generating that readiness report. I'll skip over fast track here, uh, aka.ms slash how to shift. Uh, I just wanna call this out, Jeremy Chapman and I, Mr. Microsoft Mechanics, who's doing his big mechanics show here. Uh, we work together on the same team. We essentially wrote a step one to eight guidance on how to get to the modern desktop, which is Windows and Office. We did it from the terms of not marketing, of IT guys, right? These are the actual things you have to remediate. This is what you're gonna to wanna to check for. These are the tools to use within Microsoft. So if you go and hit that how to shift page, you'll see our documentation here. Jeremy recorded a video for each step as well, and we have a lab kit that you can download as well. Uh, just to sum it all up is we are trying to get more technical documentation out there that tells you how to do things that's not marketing spun, right? We wanna give you the true technical details, so. Uh, I am a minute over, I, I always do go over. Uh, thank you so much for, for attending the session. Again, I will be out on the, uh, the hub floor. Please come bother me. I have a hands-on lab tomorrow. I hope to see uh, more of you in as well. Check out How to Shift. Have a great rest of your day. Go check out Jeremy at Microsoft Mechanics. Go have a wonderful lunch and I'll see the rest of you around. Thank you again.